things have not been going well. Uh, if you're the Confederate Army, uh, Jubal Early's command, as you're moving into uh, the, what becomes the Battle of Monocacy Junction, uh, about 8.30 in the morning or so, things got kicked off just up where we were at the Best Farm. The division of Stephen D. Rams are moving into the area using small unit tactics, reinforcing that theme of we're not trying to commit to this massive assault. We're not trying to have this massed infantry engaging here. Their expectation still that they're going to brush away a limited defense that they see in front of them. Countering that is the beginning of that federal theme, that U.S. theme of stubbornness. We have 100 days men fighting well above their expected skill set. We have uh, veterans of hardened campaigns such as the Overland campaign, which had just wrapped up only weeks before. And what is going to happen in this moment is the Battle of Monocacy Junction begins its long, slow pivot. Remember, the battle, as we were just discussing, it was beginning in a north to south movement. Right. Confederates initially looking to move across the Monocacy Junction by taking the Baltimore Pike. Ohio troops from the National Guard putting up a staunch defense there, forcing them to consider different options. So they moved over to the Georgetown Pike, modern day Route 355, which cuts through the heart of modern day Monocacy National Battlefield. That same thoroughfare is where they're looking to go uh, in a sort of still north to south movement. Again, making this attempted run on Washington, D.C., Washington City, as it's known at the time, the national capital. But there's that theme, that stubborn defense they were expecting to wipe away. It's again been keeping them kind of uh, isolated to the best farm. So we begin this long, slow movement where we start to look for ways across the river to begin what's known as sort of the east-west movement of the battle. What ended, I guess what ends up becoming the final sort of trajectory of things. Once they get across the river, the battle stops moving about moving north-south and pushing the U.S. troops out to the east. But that brings us here. Uh, to the Worthington Ford, or the approximate location of it. Now, prior to filming here, uh, our good man, Matt Borders, was getting a little giddy because we might be standing actually right within feet of the original location. We knew we were within yards. Right. Uh, perhaps uh, a football field or less in space, but we might be standing on the real location of it. Some uh, future stuff to come back to. But why are they coming here, and who is coming here? Is It's McClausland. It's a bunch of Confederates that are looking for a way across the river to the Worthington property. That's right, Pat. So what we have here is about 1,200 troopers from John McCausland's Confederate Cavalry. Brigadier General John Tiger John McCausland, very aggressive commander, not having a great relationship with Jubal Early. Jubal Early thinks uh, his Confederate Cavaliers are, as he called them, buttermilk raiders. We Really did not care for McCausland and his Cavalry Command. Most of the Confederate cavalry has actually begun what's known as the Johnson-Gilmore Raid, sweeping well north and east of Frederick, Maryland. And so the only cavaliers that Early can utilize during the battle here at Monocacy is Tiger John McCausland. McCausland's gonna do his job though. He's gonna move about a mile to the west of, mile and a half to the west of Best Farm, and he discovers the Worthington Ford. The Ford was not unguarded however company b of the 8th illinois cavalry is here right within this vicinity they will contest the crossing which probably occurs somewhere around 11 30 or so about this in the morning about the same time that jubal early is actually reaching the field early would comment on this in his post-war reminiscences describing how by the time he had reached the field the commanders on the ground had solved the problem meaning how to get further south for him <laughs> by discovering this Ford. Now, McCausland's Cavaliers, again, 1,200 of them, they heavily outnumber the 8th Illinois Cavalry. They will push them away from the Ford and gain access to this side, the south side of the Monoxy River. They are going to continue to push up towards the Worthington property, which you'll see soon. We're on the Worthington farm now, but up near the Worthington house, they will push the 8th Illinois or Company B away from that structure driving them off to the east. Now, once McCausland gets up to the Worthington farm, he believes he has gained the flank of the federal line. Remember, Confederate forces think they're dealing with just militia, maybe some particularly stubborn militia, but still, they think they're dealing with men they should really be able to drive fairly easily. And so with gaining their flank, John McCausland is now gonna order his troopers to dismount in mass in preparation for an attack. One of his cavaliers later wrote that we were told to tie up our horses or turn them loose. No man could be spared to hold them because McCausland wants to put as much power as possible into this attack.